a series called Pray Like This. And Pastor Chad had opened us up telling us that this is a prayer that we can model our prayers after. And I really liked that he said that because sometimes when we see the Lord's Prayer and we read it, we think that we have to pray it like this. But I like that Jesus said, pray like this. Not, not pray it like this, but pray like this. Do this. And as we have broken down this prayer into parts, we found some really, really good nuggets of truth. And so before we start and recap, I just want to pray. So would you join me? Father, we just come before you today. I just offer myself and my voice and my thoughts. And Lord, I just ask for your peace to be here with us today. Lord, would you open hearts and minds and help us to hear what you have to say today. We want to honor you this morning. Thank you for your word. Thank you for your Holy Spirit being amongst us. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. So Pastor Chad had opened up this particular series, and he started off with Our Father in Heaven. And when he said that, praying like this, it, he said it establishes our relationship to God, that this relationship gives us the right to be heard by our Father. And I really loved that little piece. The next one he did was Hallowed Be Your Name. Praying like this established that God is holy and that this understanding that he is holy places us under his sovereignty, that he is Lord over our lives. Amen. Pastor Jorge Flores came. Did everybody enjoy that message? That was so good. Pastor Jorge did your kingdom come, that praying like this acknowledges that we are citizens of a kingdom that is not of this earth, that we have the privilege of sharing this kingdom and the, mess and the message that comes with it with others because we are ambassadors. And then last week, Pastor Tim did your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Everybody remembers Sons of Thunder? Yep. Hey, they remember... <laughs> I loved that you put that in there. That was so awesome. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Praying this acknowledges that God's will is supreme. And he gets to drive our ship. It's not my will, but it's his will be done. Super good steps in this series of building one line upon another. So today we're going to unpack Give us this day our daily bread. And our verses from Matthew 6, 11, where Jesus said, give us this day our daily bread. And every time I read this verse, I always think of fresh baked bread. Every time. You know how that aroma of bread just draws you right in. The first thing I want to do whenever I get around fresh baked bread is I just want to take a deep, deep sniff of that bread. I pick it up <sighs> because it smells so amazing. The fly, all the flavors, whatever they might have put in it, the yeast, there's just something wonderful about it. Is there anybody here that bakes bread? There's some, there, Y'all should share. <laughs> share. <laughs> Somebody bring a loaf and just like start handing out little pieces. <laughs> <laughs> in Jesus' time, bread was a staple food, and it still is in many places around the world. My family likes to watch this show on YouTube. I don't know what it's called, but his name is Sonny, and he travels all over the world, and almost every place that he goes to, bread is present at the table in every place. It's a big part of the cultures. It's it's in all these little different countries and all these little regions. It's used as a bowl, as a utensil, as a spoon, as something just to sop up the goodness of the last bit in a dish. It's often broken first and given to the guest as a sign of fellowship and as an invitation to take the first bite because it's a sign of hospitality. Give us this day our daily bread. So praying like this, it acknowledges where we get our daily needs fulfilled. Yes. If we are not going to the Father, like Pastor Deb talked about, 
Whatever it is, if we are not going to the Father to get our needs met, we may not be getting what we actually need. We may be just barely surviving rather than thriving and feeling less than fulfilled, less than satisfied, and missing out on something. So today we're going to take a look at three kinds of bread that this give us this day our daily bread can represent and the need that it fulfills in our lives. And the first one is physical bread. It satisfies hunger because God fulfills our physical needs. Hunger is a daily need that we must have fulfilled. Anybody agree? Anybody's stomach right now saying, lunch is coming, lunch is coming. Okay. Bread symbolizes sustenance. But here in this particular passage, Jesus is talking. He's not just talking about symbolic bread. It's not just symbolized bread. He's talking about the real stuff, real actual bread. So when we're praying, we are asking God for real daily bread, real sustenance. So part of this, I think that we have to kind of get our brain out of our 21st century thinking, and we have to get back into Jesus's day. Because Jesus is giving us this model of prayer that asks for us to ask him for real bread, real food, daily food. And if we think of what they went through back then, just to eat is something else. They were going to have to build their own oven. They were going to need to gather whatever they needed to be able to burn the fire, to be able to cook the food. They were going to have to plant the seed, watch it grow, harvest it, grind the grain to the flour, make the dough, bake the bread, and then finally eat it. It was a real process. It was a daily thing for sure. And it, it was their bread for the table. And how thankful and grateful are we that we get to like skip that whole process. And we just get in our 21st century selves, get to just go to the store, grab a loaf and bring it home. We may also want to know how to bake beautiful bread. So if you haven't made bread yet, ever, I would encourage you, take the time, get a recipe. There's some really good ones. Quick, fast, and easy. Use a bread machine. You know, make it simple. Don't, don't do it the long way if it's like, <gasps> just, just do it. It's a great skill to have because daily bread isn't just about actual bread, but it's about all of our necessities. And that's what I love about this with Jesus some of the essential ingredients to our survival are things like food, water, clothing, sleep, shelter. These are the bare necessities of what we need. And Jesus knew the importance of meeting all of our physical needs. And we know because we often found Jesus actually multiplying bread and fish for people to meet their physical, actual hunger and he also said to the woman at the well in John 4, 13 and 14, whoever drinks this water, he's speaking of the well that was there, will thirst again. But whoever drinks of the water that I shall give will never thirst. Yeah. He said shortly after he gave this, certain, this particular prayer we are talking about today, in Matthew 6, 30, he says, if God so clothed the grass of the field, which is today, and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? He also said in Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28, come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. All of these things express God's faithfulness to us, that he will meet our physical, actual needs. Jesus didn't leave out our daily necessities in this prayer. So are you, are you praying for those things? Or are you just trying to make it, just trying to get it done? Sometimes I think that we don't actually ask for things, like Pastor Deb said. Some of the things, just pick anything. We just don't pray about it. We just don't ask our Father. And we can. He's there. 
So first, I have this little part, congregational participation. Can we just take a minute and just thank God for the necessities that he has already given us? Father, we just thank you right now. And we give you praise, God, for all the physical needs that you have met for us. Thank you for our homes, for our jobs, for our cars, for the, our for our family and friends. Thank you for our pillows at night and our clothes that we wear, for the food in our fridge, money in our pocket to be able to go get more food. Lord, we thank you. We thank you that you meet all of our physical needs. I find it interesting, though, that when Jesus spoke about these physical needs of food, water, clothing, sleep, he didn't talk the same way about shelter at all. In Psalms, David talked about the Lord being his shelter in Psalm 91. He said, he who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. But Jesus, Jesus said things like this, Matthew 8, 20, foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests. But the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Hmm. In Matthew 7, 24, he said, Everyone who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. So something different there that he talked about shelter because he is our shelter. And that brings us to our second type of bread, our spiritual bread. Because God doesn't just take care of our physical needs. He also fulfills our spiritual needs. There's something deeper than our physical needs that have to be addressed. It's the needs of our spirit. In John 6, 35, it says this. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger. And whoever believes in me shall never thirst. So Jesus is the bread of life. And Jesus goes on in this chapter telling them that all that the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me I will never cast out. And he said, I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. But they grumbled at him. And in John 6, 47, it says, Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness, and they died. This is the bread that comes down from heaven, so that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. So Jesus said, you need spiritual bread. So we can't always just think about just our physical needs. We have to attend to our spiritual needs. If you want that hunger and that thirst in your spirit to be satisfied, Jesus said, come to me. What does spiritual hunger and thirst feel like? Hunger and thirst are the body's reaction to need. So when we're hungry, we eat. And when we're thirsty, we? Yes. But when our spirit is hungry, we yearn. And when our spirit is thirsty, we groan. It kind of sounds like, I want, and I'm whining. I want it, I just want it, and I'm whining. That's what it sounds like when your spirit is hungry. You're in want all the time, and you're whining all the time. Bread satisfies our daily hunger, but this spiritual bread, Jesus himself satisfies our deepest need to truly live. He is the bread of life. Jesus said in Matthew 6, Matthew 5, 6, he said, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. So he gives us something particular to hunger and thirst after, righteousness. The issue is that we don't hunger and thirst for it. We don't actually hunger and thirst for righteousness most days. We hunger and thirst for other things, for lesser things. 
We want for power, for money, for sex, for fame, for attention, for whatever, whatever it might be. We hunger for it. And we whine about what we don't have. It's not good enough. We want something better. It's not enough anymore. Whatever it is, it's just not enough anymore. We make other things what we desire and want more than God and righteousness. Anybody ever been there? It happens, and it's hard. And we've been saving money for a while for a car, and for a long time, I haven't been able to like make up my mind about what exactly kind of car I want, but I just knew I wanted one. So what happens is I end up like this, car, 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 looking at car, 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 and then I get distracted, and I'm like, oh, that's funny, that's funny, that's funny, that's stupid, I don't want to watch that. That's funny, that's funny. And I get distracted for like two hours. And then I whine at my husband. Are we going to go look at a car? I want to go look at a car. It's so fun. We bristle at that statement that we desire and we want something more than God and righteousness because we know, we know that it's true. We know it's true that we want other things more than God and righteousness. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for living in us. Every day we find our hearts and souls longing for other things. And I just, I just want a CRV. A Honda CRV, that's what I want. I want a blue one with heated seats. It's true. <laughs> but Jesus pointed out that it is righteousness that is actually our deepest need. It's not stuff. It's not things. It's not people. It's God and righteousness. Amen. And that righteousness, wow. Oh. That righteousness, it satisfies our hunger and our thirst. So how do we get it? Well, first, we have to realize that we don't actually have it. We don't have righteousness. Romans 3.10 says there's none righteous, no, not one. Nobody has it. We all need it. Then we need to recognize that righteousness has come to us through Jesus, only through Jesus. It was manifested among us, and through faith in Jesus Christ, it is for all who believe. Romans 3.23 and 24. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. He is how we get it. And by faith we receive it. The righteousness that was manifested, Romans 3, 26, it was to show his righteousness at the present time so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. And so having faith in Jesus Christ is how we get it. It's awesome. You have a question. Romans 3.10. No problem. See, our true spiritual bread leads to eternal life and righteousness. Jesus himself leads to eternal life and righteousness. When we believe, if we're partaking in that kind of bread... We will see God everywhere that we go. Instead of, like myself, seeing every single CRV on the road. <laughs> because it's been on my mind. I have been wanting and whining after CRVs for weeks. And they are everywhere. They're everywhere. And I want one so bad. But the Lord used this as an example to me to show me what it's like when we want and whine after other things and not keeping our eyes on Jesus. If we have Christ and we're keeping our eyes on him, we will see him and what he is doing all around us every day, all the time. We will see him at work in our world. And when we get, then we get to do something really cool. We get to step into that grand story and adventure with him. Because 
at some point, if our eyes are on him and we're seeing his hands and his work and what he's doing, he will go, you know, you should probably go talk to that person. The best way for us to stay out of being in uncomfortable situations where God might use us is to want and whine after everything else. It's the best way. It really is. Jesus came to bring us what was truly important, salvation, the forgiveness of our sins. If we don't have that, then we want wine after everything. And there is no hope because there's nothing else to want for. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved is what the scripture says. I love this in 1 John 1, 9. It says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. He replaces every old thing with this new thing, righteousness in him. Praise God. Thank you, Father. In Jesus, he provides everything that we need. Our final bread today I kind of struggled with this one a little bit, trying to, trying to figure out how this one went together. And it took a lot of prayer. And, but it's, it's the body of Christ, which is also called one bread, because God fulfills even our relational needs. In 1 Corinthians 10, it says this in 16 and 17, the cup of blessing that we bless Is it not a participation in the blood of Christ? The bread that we break, is it not a participation in the body of Christ? Because there is one bread, we who are many are one body, for we all partake of the one bread. Here's a different kind of bread. And in 1 Corinthians, where this verse is, We're reading this in chapter 10, but the context of this particular verse is that Paul is speaking a warning about idolatry, which I thought was kind of interesting that he he would say this right in the middle of this, but he tells the Corinthian church about Moses in the desert, and he says when they were led by the people of Israel out of Egypt, how they would follow the cloud, and they passed through the sea, And Paul says, they all ate of the same spiritual food, which was that manna from heaven from Exodus 16. Moses said, this is the bread from heaven. And they all drank from the same spiritual rock, which was from the rock that followed them, which was called living water, which was also Christ. But he is making a point in saying this. He is expressing that when we break bread together, we're representing friendship and fellowship with one another in the body. That's what he's talking about. To eat with others meant to be kind of a one body with them, one with another, a communion, and being in connection with other people. So this is why you will find throughout the scriptures where the Pharisees often said to to the disciples, Why does your master eat with prostitutes and tax collectors? Why is he doing this? Why is he doing this kind of one with another communion kind of thing with them? Why is he doing that? And they were saying, why is he being at one with them? Because it was forbidden. In 2 Corinthians 6, Paul says this, 11 through 16. I'm just going to read it, so I don't want you to look for it. I just want you to listen to what it's saying. Oh, Corinthians, we have spoken openly to you. Our heart is wide open. You are not restricted by us, but you are restricted by your own affections. Do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness? And what communion has light with darkness? And what accord has Christ with Belial? Or what part has a believer with an unbeliever? And what agreement has the temple of God with idols? When I read this, I stopped right in my tracks. 
what agreement has the temple of God with idols? He didn't say, what agreement has the temple of God with the temple of idols? He didn't say that. He said, what agreement has the temple of God with idols? And then he says, for you are the temple of the living God. So it made me pause and think to myself, well, if he says, what agreement does the temple of God have with idols? Is that why when we don't have God and we're the temple of God, when we don't have Christ, we make ourselves our own idol? We make ourselves our own want after everything? And he goes on to say, as God has said, I will dwell in them and walk among them. I will be their God, and they shall be my people. See, either we are the temple of the living God, or we are our own idol. Jesus came to redeem us and to redeem our relationships and to make them holy in him. This body, holy. And when we come together as one body, when we eat together, when we fellowship together, when we even take communion together, when we work together, we're saying, I choose these people to be joined to. These are the people I choose with my heart, with my being, because we are one, one body. Amen. It's not just a me and God thing. It never was. It's never been just a me and God thing. It's always been us together as one. It's always been about unity. And how important is the message of unity in our world now, where everything seems so broken and divided? God knows we need like-minded people to do life with. Right? Now, remember I said that this passage is in the context of idolatry, and we don't want to join ourselves to idols. But we also don't want to stay so separate that we don't offer what we have. We have Christ in us, the hope of glory, and we're supposed to share as we go about our day because people out there, they're looking, they're wanting and whining after everything, and only Christ satisfies. 1 Corinthians 10, we're going to read it again, 16 and 17. The cup of blessing that we bless, is it not a participation in the blood of Christ? The bread that we break, is it not a participation in the body of Christ? Because there is one bread. We who are many are one body, for we all partake of the one bread. So we have to be careful that what we want, what we are hungering and thirsting after is Christ himself. That it is not for our own selfish wants, for our own selfish ways, our selfish appetites, all our desires. We also have to be careful that we're not making other people our idols, that we're not following after the will of other people because we're afraid of what they might think of us. Christ is our king, Amen. period. We must watch out for how we may cause others in our church community to stumble and turn away from the Lord because we are all a part of his body. We are one bread. I love that at the Last Supper, Jesus took the bread and he broke it. And he said this, take, eat, this is my body broken for you because this represents his physical body that would be broken on the cross where one man, Christ Jesus, would die for the sins of many and he would make everyone who believed one body 
He made us family. We were created for this kind of community because we're not meant to do life alone. Not. If we could have our prayer teams come on up, I want to I wanna do something a little different this morning. The Lord cares deeply for us. He gives us daily bread to sustain us. But some of us, we're barely making it. Our physical, actual needs need met. If you have a physical, actual need, either in your body, in your household, in your finances, I want you just to come forward and come up here. If you have an actual, physical, daily need that needs to be met, because we're going to ask our Father today. If you need help in any way, he also gives us the spiritual bread so that we can truly live. So if you need, you just know you need more of Jesus. And maybe you've been distracted. Maybe, maybe you've been frustrated. Maybe you just need him to take care of you and get your spirit and your soul in order. I want you to come down here. We all need it. If I could stick myself on the front row because I've been longing and whining after a car. He gives us relational bread so that we have a family to lean on. If you're lacking in fulfilling relationships, maybe your heart is broken, maybe you've been hurt by church hurt that you've experienced in your life, or you just want some real friends for once in your life, come down here. Family of God, can you reach out your hands or even go stand with someone that is receiving prayer today. Just reach out your hands. Father, we bring every need that is represented here today. Holy Spirit, would you come and minister to your people today? Lord, would you touch minds and would you mend hearts? Father, we ask that you would provide for the daily needs. God, would you bring provision? We just break off every pursuing spirit that devours finances right now in the name of Jesus. Lord, we pray that you would bring in every need financial need, physical need, food, a bill paid, whatever it is, Lord. Papa, we ask you for it. And Lord, for your spiritual bread, save us today from our own selves. Reorient our hearts, Lord, to your throne and to your grace. We say stop right now to any scheme of the enemy and any device of the enemy that is at work against us to distract us and deter us from you. Lord, right now, we ask in the name of Jesus, draw us back to you. Remove anything that's in the way. We just say, I want more of you, God. I want more of you. I need more of you. We need more of you, God. We can't do this on our own. And Father, we ask for relational bread. Would you bring oneness among the body of Christ? The Big C Church and our church right here, would you bring oneness among the body of Christ? God, would you bring healthy relationships in our church and in our families? We just say to any spirit of offense, cease and desist your assignment right now in the name of Jesus. 
And we ask, Lord, for your sweet presence of peace to be in our relationships, God. We ask for your peace, your shalom. Father, we ask that you would mend any heart that's broken by church hurt. And we just say, as a representative of the church, I just say, I'm sorry for hurting you. Would you forgive me, please? And Lord, would you bring peace and restoration and reconciliation in the body of Christ among people? Lord, all across this city right now, God, we just ask for relational reconciliation among your people in the name of Jesus. And I want to pray, pray this psalm over you guys today, over our whole church, Psalm 4. Father, answer us when I call. Answer us when we call, O God of our righteousness. You have given us relief when we were distressed. You know our needs, Lord. Be gracious to us and hear our prayers, Lord. How long will we walk where your glory had been turned to shame? How long will we love worthless things and seek falsehood? Father, we return to you today. We confess and we repent, God. We need you. I need you. Lord, you have set apart for yourself those who are godly. The Lord will hear when we call to him. We see, Lord, how the world is so far from you and that anger wells up. But we will be angry and not sin. We will meditate in our hearts and be still. We will look to your word of truth and not to other things. We will offer the sacrifice of righteousness, which is to walk in your ways and to keep our eyes on you, Lord. We put our trust in you, Lord. There are many who say, who will show us any good? Lord, lift up the light of your countenance upon us. We pray to you today, Lord, bless us. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and to give you peace. You, God, have put gladness in our hearts. No matter if we are in times of plenty or in time of trouble, more than any other season, even when the grain and the wine is increased, we will lie down in peace and sleep. For you alone, O oh Lord, make us dwell in safety. Amen. Amen.